Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Haunted House by Edith Nesbitt It was by the merest accident that Desmond ever went to the haunted house. He had been away from England for six years, and the nine months leave taught him how easily one drops out of one's place. He had taken rooms at the Greyhound before he found that there was no reason why he should stay in Elmstead rather than in any other London's dismal outpost. He wrote to all the friends whose addresses he could remember and sailed himself to await their answers. He wanted someone to talk to, and there was no one. Meantime, he lounged on the horsehair sofa with the advertisements, and his pleasant gray eyes followed line after line with intolerable boredom. Then suddenly, hello, he said and sat up. This is what he read. A haunted house. Advertisers anxious to have phenomena investigated. Any properly accredited investigator will be given full facilities. Address by letter only, Wilden Pryor, 237 Museum Street, London. That's rum, he said. Wilden Pryor had been the best wicked keeper in his club. It wasn't a common name. Anyway, it was worth trying, so he sent off a telegram. Wilden Pryor, 237 Museum Street, London. May I come to you for a day or two and see the ghost? William Desmond. On returning the next day from a stroll, there was an orange envelope on the wide Pembroke table in his parlor. Delighted. Expect you today. Book to Crittenden from Charing Cross, wire train. Wilden Pryor, Ormhurst Rectory, Kent. So, that's all right, said Desmond, and went off to pack his bag and ask in the bar for a timetable. Good old Wilden. It will be rippling seeing him again. A curious little omnibus, rather like a bathing machine, was waiting outside Crittenden Station, and his driver, a swarthy, blunt-faced little man with liquid eyes, said, You a friend of Mr. Pryor, sir? Shut him up in the bathing machine and banged the door on him. It was a very long drive, less pleasant than it would have been in an open carriage. The last part of the journey was through a wood. Then came a churchyard and a church, and the bathing machine turned in at a gate under heavy trees and drew up in front of a white house with bare, gaunt windows. Cheerful place upon my soul, Desmond told himself as he tumbled out of the back of the bathing machine. The driver set his bag on the discolored doorstep and drove off. Desmond pulled a rusty chain and a big-throated bell jangled above his head. Nobody came to the door and he rang again. Still nobody came, but he heard a window thrown open above the perch. He stepped back onto the gravel and looked up. A young man with rough hair and pale eyes was looking out. Not Wilden, nothing like Wilden. He did not speak, but he seemed to be making signs, and signs seemed to mean go away. I came to see Mr. Pryor, said Desmond. Instantly and softly, the window closed. Is it a lunatic asylum I've come to by chance? Desmond asked himself and pulled again at the rusty chain. Steps sounded inside the house, the sound of boots on stone. Bolts were shot back, the door opened, and Desmond, rather hot and a little annoyed, found himself looking into a pair of very dark, friendly eyes, and a very pleasant voice said, Mr. Desmond, I presume, do come in and let me apologize. The speaker shook him warmly by the hand, and he found himself falling down a flagged passage, a man of more than mature age, well-dressed, handsome, with an air of competence and alertness, which we associate with what is called a man of the world. He opened a door and led the way into a shabby, bookish, leathery room. Do sit down, Mr. Desmond. This must be the uncle, I suppose, Desmond thought, as he fitted himself into the shabby, perfect curves of the armchair. How's Wilden? he asked aloud. All right, I hope. The other looked at him. I beg your pardon, he said doubtfully. I was asking how Wilden is. I'm quite well. I thank you, said the other man with some formality. I beg your pardon. 
It was now Desmond's turn to say it. I did not realize that your name might be Wilden, too. I meant Wilden Pryor. I am Wilden Pryor, said the other. And you, I presume, are the expert from the Psychic Society? Good Lord, no, said Desmond. I'm Wilden Pryor's friend. And, of course, there must be two Wilden Pryors. You sent the telegram? You are Mr. Desmond? The psychical research were to send an expert, and I thought... I see, said Desmond, and I thought you were Wilden Pryor, an old friend of mine, a young man, he said, and half rose. Now don't, said Wilden Pryor. No doubt. It is my nephew who is your friend. Did he know you were coming? But of course he didn't. I'm wondering, but I am exceedingly glad to see you. You will stay, will you not? If you can endure to be the guest of an old man, and I will write to Will tonight and ask him to join us. That's most awfully good of you, Desmond assured him. I shall be glad to stay. I was awfully pleased when I saw Wilden's name in the paper because, and out came the tale of Elmstead, its loneliness and disappointment. Mr. Pryor listened with the kindest interest. And you have not found your friends? How sad. But they will write to you, of course. You left your address. I didn't, by Joe, said Desmond, but I can write. Can I catch the post? Easily, the elder man assured him. Write your letters now. My man shall take them to the post, and then we shall have dinner, and I will tell you about the ghost. Desmond wrote his letters quickly, Mr. Pryor just then reappearing. Now, I'll take you to your room, he said, gathering the letters in long white hands. You'll like a rest, dinner at eight. The bedchamber, like the parlor, had a pleasant air of worn luxury and accustomed comfort. I hope you will be comfortable, the host said with courteous solicitude, and Desmond was quite sure that he would. Three covers were laid. The swarthy man who had driven Desmond from the station stood behind the host's chair, and a figure came towards Desmond and his host from the shadows beyond the yellow circles of the silver stick candles. My assistant, Mr. Verney, said the host, and Desmond surrendered his hand to the limp, damp touch of the man who had seemed to say to him from the window of the porch, go away. Was Mr. Pryor perhaps a doctor who received paying guests? persons who were in Desmond's phrase, a bit balmy, but he had said assistant. I thought, said Desmond hastily, you would be a clergyman, director, you know. I thought Wilden, my friend Wilden, was staying with an uncle who was a clergyman. Oh no, said Mr. Pryor, I rent the rectory. Director thinks it is damp. The church is disused too. It's not considered safe and they can't afford to restore it. Clever to Mr. Desmond, Lopez, and the swarthy, blunt-faced man filled his glass. I find this place very convenient for my experiments. I dabble a little in chemistry, Mr. Desmond, and Vernie here assists me. Vernie murmured something that sounded like only too proud and subsided. We all have our hobbies and chemistry is mine, Mr. Pryor went on. Fortunately, I have a little income which enables me to indulge it. Wilden, my nephew, you know, laughs at me and calls it the science of smells but it's absorbing, very absorbing. After dinner, Verney faded away, and Desmond and his host stretched their feet to what Mr. Pryor called a handful of fire, for the evening had grown chill. And now, Desmond said, won't you tell me the ghost story? The other glanced around the room. There isn't really a ghost story at all. It's only that, well, it's never happened to me personally, but it happened to Verney, per lad, and he's never been quite his own self since. Desmond flattered himself on his insight. Is mine the haunted room, he asked. It doesn't come to any particular room, said the other, slowly, nor to any particular person. Anyone may happen to see it? No one sees it. It isn't the kind of ghost that's seen or heard. I'm afraid. I'm rather stupid, but I don't understand, said Desmond roundly. How can it be a ghost if you neither hear it nor see it? I did not say it was a ghost. Mr. Pryor corrected. I only say that there is something about this house which is not ordinary. Several of my assistants have had to leave. The thing got on their nerves. What became of the assistants? asked Desmond. Oh, they left. You know, they left. Pryor answered vaguely. One couldn't expect them to sacrifice their health. I sometimes think village gossip is a deadly thing, Mr. Desmond that perhaps they were prepared to be frightened, that they fancy things, 
I hope that the Psychical Society's expert, who won't be a neurotic, but even without being neurotic, one might. But you don't believe in ghosts, Mr. Desmond. Your Anglo-Saxon common sense forbids it. I'm afraid I'm not exactly Anglo-Saxon, said Desmond. On my father's side, I'm pure Celt, though I know I don't do credit to the race. And on your mother's side, Mr. Pryor asked with extraordinary eagerness, an eagerness so sudden and disproportionate to the question that Desmond stared. A faint touch of resentment as suddenly stirred in him the first spark of antagonism to his host. Oh, he said lightly, I think I must have Chinese blood. I get on so well with the natives in Shanghai, and they tell me I owe my nose to a Red Indian great-grandmother. No Negro blood, I suppose, the host asked, with almost discourteous insistence. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Desmond answered. He meant to say it laughingly, but he didn't. My hair, you know, it's a very stiff curl it's got, and my mother's people were in the West Indies a few generations ago. You're interested in distinctions of race, I take it? Not at all, not at all, Mr. Pryor surprisingly assured him. But, of course, any details of your family are necessarily interesting to me, I feel. He added with another of his winning smiles. That you and I are already friends. Desmond could not have reasonably defended the faint quality of dislike that had begun to tinge his first pleasant sense of being welcomed and wished for as a guest. You're very kind, he said. It's jolly of you to take in a stranger like this. Mr. Pryor smiled, handed him a cigar box, mixed whiskey and soda, and began to talk about the history of the house. The foundations are almost certainly 13th century. It was a priory, you know. There's a curious tale, by the way, about the man Henry gave it to when he smashed up the monasteries. There was a curse. There seems always to have been a curse. The gentle, pleasant, high-bred voice went on. Desmond thought he was listening, but presently he roused himself and dragged his attention back to the words that were being spoken. That made the fifth death. There is one every hundred years and always in the same mysterious way. Then he found himself on his feet, incredibly sleepy, and heard himself say, These old stories are tremendously interesting. Thank you very much. I hope you won't think me very uncivil, but I think I'd rather like to turn in. I feel a bit tired somehow. But of course, my dear chap, Mr. Pryor saw Desmond to his room. Got everything you want? Right. Lock the door if you should feel nervous. Of course, a lot. Can't keep ghosts out. But I always feel as if it is could, and with another of those pleasant, friendly laughs, he was gone. William Desmond went to bed. A strong young man, sleepy indeed, beyond his experience of sleepiness, but well and comfortable. He awoke faint and trembling, lying deep in the pillows of his feather bed and lukewarm waves of exhaustion swept through him. Where was he? What had happened? His brain, dizzy and weak at first, refused him any answer. When he remembered the abrupt spasm of repulsion, which he had felt so suddenly and unreasonably the night before, came back to him in a hot, breathless flush. He had been drugged. He had been poisoned. I must get out of this, he told himself, and blundered out of bed, towards a silken bell pull that he had noticed the night before hanging near the door. As he pulled it, the bed and the wardrobe and the room rose up around him and fell on him, and he fainted. When he knew next anything, someone was putting brandy to his lips. He saw Pryor, the kindest concern on his face. The assistant, pale and watery-eyed, the swarthy manservant, stolid, silent, and expressionless, he heard Vernet say to Pryor, you see, it was too much. I told you. Hush, said Pryor. He's coming too. Four days later, Desmond, lying on a wicker chair on the lawn, was a little disinclined for exertion, but no longer ill. Nourishing foods and drinks, beef tea, stimulants, and constant care, these had brought him back to something like his normal state. He wondered at the vague suspicions, vaguely remembered of that first night, they had all been proved absurd by the unwavering care and kindness of everyone in the haunted house. But what caused it? He asked his host for the fifth time. What made me such a fool of myself? And this time Mr. Pryor did not put him off, as he had always done before by begging him to wait till he was stronger. I'm afraid, you know, he said, that the ghost really did come to you. I'm inclined to revise my opinion of the ghost. But 
Why didn't it come again? I have been with you every night, you know, his host reminded him. And indeed, the sufferer had never been left alone since the ringing of his bell on that terrible first morning. And now, Mr. Pryor went on, if you will not think me inhospitable, I think you will be better away from here. You ought to go to the seaside. There haven't been any letters for me, I suppose, Desmond said a little wistfully. Not one. I suppose you gave the right address. Ormhurst Rectory, Crittenden, Kent. I don't think I put Crittenden, said Desmond. I copied the address from your telegram. He pulled the pink paper from his pocket. Ah, that would account, said the other. You've been most awfully kind all through, said Desmond abruptly. Nonsense, my boy, said the older man benevolently. I only wish Willie had been able to come. He's never written the rascal. Nothing but the telegram to say he could not come and was writing. I suppose he's having a jolly time somewhere, said Desmond enviously. But look here, do tell me about the ghost, if there's anything to tell. I'm almost quite well now, and I should like to know what it was that made a fool of me like that. Well, Mr. Pryor looked round him at the golden red of dahlias and sunflowers, gay in the September sunshine. Here and now, I don't know that it could do any harm. You remember that story of the man who got this place from Henry VIII and the curse? That man's wife is buried in a vault under the church. Well, there were legends, and I confess I was curious to see her tomb. There are iron gates to the vault. Locked they were. I opened them with an old key, and I couldn't get them to shut again. Yes, Desmond said. You think I might have sent for a locksmith, but the fact is there is a small crypt to the church, and I've used that crypt as a supplementary laboratory. If I had called anyone in to see to the lock, they would have gossiped. I should have been turned out of my laboratory, perhaps out of my house. I see. Now, the curious thing is, Mr. Pryor went on lowering his voice, that it is only since that grating was opened that this house has been what they call haunted. It is since then that all the things have happened. What things? People staying here, suddenly ill, just as you were. And the attacks always seem to indicate loss of blood. And, he hesitated a moment, that wound in your throat. I told you you had hurt yourself falling when you rang the bell, but that was not true. What is true is that you had on your throat just the same little white wound that all the others have had. I wish, he frowned, that I could get that vault gate shut again. The key won't turn. I wonder if I could do anything, Desmond asked, secretly convinced that he had hurt his throat in falling and that his whole story was, as he put it, all moonshine. Still, to put a lock right was but a slight return for all the care and kindness. I'm an engineer, you know, he added awkwardly and rose. Probably a little oil. Let's have a look at the same lock. He followed Mr. Pryor through the house to the church. A bright, smooth old key turned readily, and they passed into the building. Musty and damp, where ivy crawled through the broken windows and the blue sky, seemed to be laid close against the holes in the roof. Another key clicked in the lock of a low door, beside what had once been the Lady Chapel, a thick oak door grated back, and Mr. Pryor stopped a moment to light a candle that waited in its rough iron candlestick on a ledge of the stonework. Then down narrow stairs, chipped a little at the edges and soft with dust. The crypt was Norman, very simply beautiful. At the end of it was a recess, masked with a grating of rusty ironwork. They used to think, said Mr. Pryor, that iron kept off witchcraft. This is the lock, he went on, holding the candle against the gate, which was ajar. They went through the gate because the lock was on the other side. Desmond worked a minute or two with the oil and feather that he had brought. Then with a little wrench, the key turned and returned. I think that's all right, he said looking up, kneeling on one knee, with a key still in the lock and his hand on it. May I try it? Mr. Pryor took Desmond's place, turned the key, pulled it out, and stood up. Then the key and the candlestick fell rattling on the stone floor, and the old man sprang upon Desmond. Now I've got you, he growled in the darkness. 
And Desmond says that his spring and his clutch and his voice were like the spring and the clutch and the growl of a strong, savage beast. Desmond's little strength snapped like a twig at his first bracing of it to resistance. The old man held them as a vice holds. He had got a rope from somewhere. He was tying Desmond's arms. Desmond hates to know that there in the dark he screamed like a caught hare. Then he remembered that he was a man and shouted, Help! Help! Here, help! But a hand was on his mouth, and now a handkerchief was being knotted at the back of his head. He was on the floor, leaning against something. Pryor's hands had left him. Now, said Pryor's voice, a little breathless, and the match he struck showed Desmond the stone shells with long things on them. Coffins, he supposed. Now, I'm sorry I had to do it, but signs before friendship, my dear Desmond. He went on, quite courteous and friendly. I will explain to you, and you will see that a man of honor could not act otherwise. Of course, you having no friends who know where you are is most convenient. I saw that from the first. Now I'll explain. I didn't expect you to understand by instinct, but no matter. I am, I say, it without vanity, the greatest discoverer since Newton. I know how to modify men's natures. I can make men what I choose. It's all done by transfusion of blood. Lopez, you know my man Lopez. I've pumped the blood of dogs into his veins, and he's my slave like a dog. Vernie, he's my slave too. Part dog's blood, and partly the blood of people who've come from time to time to investigate the ghost, and partly my own, because I wanted him to be clever enough to help me. And there's a bigger thing behind all this. You'll understand me when I say, here, he became very technical indeed, and used many words that meant nothing to Desmond, whose thoughts dwelt more and more on his small chance of escape. To die like a rat in a hole, a rat in a hole. If he could only loosen the handkerchief and shout again. Attend, can't you, said Pryor savagely and kicked him. I beg your pardon, my dear chap, he went on suavely. But this is important. So you see, the elixir of life is really the blood. The blood is the life, you know. And my great discovery is that to make a man immortal and restore his youth, one only needs blood from the veins of a man who unites in himself blood of the four great races. The four colors, black, white, red, and yellow. Your blood unites these four. I took as much as I dared from you that night. I was the vampire, you know, he laughed pleasantly. But your blood didn't act. The drug I had to give you to induce sleep probably destroyed the vital germs. And besides, there wasn't enough of it. Now, there is going to be enough. Desmond had been working his head against the thing behind him, easing the knot of the handkerchief down to the slip from head to neck. Now he got his mouth free and he said quickly, That was not true what I said about the Chinaman and that. I was joking. My mother's people were all Devon. I don't blame you in the least, said Pryor quietly. I should lie myself in your place. And he put back the handkerchief. The candle was now burning clearly from the place where it stood on a stone coffin. Desmond could see the long things on the shelves were coffins, not all of stone. He wondered what this madman would do with his body when everything was over. The little wound in his throat had broken out again. He could feel the slow trickle of warmth on his neck. He wondered whether he would faint. It felt like it. I wish I'd brought you here the first day. It was Vernie's doing, my tinkering about with pints and half pints. Sheer waste. Sheer wanton waste. Pryor stopped and stood looking at him. Desmond, despairingly conscious of growing physical weakness, caught himself in a real wonder as to whether this night might not be a dream, a horrible, insane dream, and he could not wholly dismiss the wonder because incredible things seemed to be adding themselves to the real horrors of the situation, just as they do in dreams. There seemed to be something stirring in the place, something that wasn't prior. No, nor prior shadow either. That was black and sprawled big across the arch roof. This was white and very small and thin, but it stirred, it grew. Now it was no longer just a line of white, but a long, narrow white wedge, and it showed between the coffin on the shelf opposite him and that coffin's lid. And still Pryor stood very still looking down on his prey, 
All emotion but a dull wonder was now dead in Desmond's weakened senses. In dreams, one called one out, one awoke, but he could not call out. Perhaps it one moved, but before he could bring his enfeebled will to the decision of movement, something else moved. The black lid of the coffin opposite rose slowly, and then suddenly fell, clattering and echoing, and from the coffin rose a form, horribly white and shrouded, and fell on prior and rolled with him on the floor of the vault in a silent, whirling struggle. The last thing Desmond heard before he fainted in good earnest was a scream Pryor uttered as he turned at the crash and saw the white shrouded body leaping towards him. It's all right, he heard next, and Vernie was bending over him with brandy. You're quite safe. He's tied up and locked in the laboratory. No, that's all right too, for Desmond's eyes had turned towards the lidless coffin. That was only me. It was the only way I could think of to save you. Can you walk now? Let me help you. So I've opened the grating. Come. Desmond blinked in the sunlight and he had never thought to see again. Here he was back in his wicker chair. He looked at the sundial on the house. The whole thing had taken less than 50 minutes. Tell me, said he, and Vernie told him in short sentences with pauses between. I tried to warn you, he said. You remember in the window? I really believed in his experiments at first and... He'd found out something about me and not told. It was when I was very young. God knows I've paid for it. And when you came, I'd only just found out what really had happened to the other chaps. That Peace Lopez let it out when he was drunk, inhuman brute, and had a row with Pryor that first night. And he promised me he wouldn't touch you. And then he did. You might have told me. You were in a nice state to be told anything, weren't you? He promised me he'd send you off as soon as you were well enough. And he had been good to me. But when I heard him begin about the grating and the key, I knew. So I just got a sheet and... But why didn't you come out before? I didn't dare. He could have tackled me easily if he had known what he was tackling. He kept moving about. It had to be done suddenly. I counted on just that moment of weakness when he really thought a dead body had come to life to defend you. Now, I'm going to harness the horse and drive you to the police station at Crittenden, and they'll send and lock him up. Everyone knew he was as mad as a hatter, but somebody had to be nearly killed before anyone would lock him up. The law's like that, you know. But you, the police, won't they? It's quite safe, said Vernie Dolly. Nobody knows but the old man, and now nobody will believe anything he says. No. He never posted your letters, of course, and he never wrote to your friend, and he put off the psychic man. No, I can't find Lopez. He must know that something's up. He's bolted. But he had not. They found him stubbornly dumb, but moaning a little, crouched against the locked grating of the vault when they came, a prudent half-dozen of them, to take the old man away from the haunted house. The master was dumb as the man. He would not speak. He has never spoken since. Chastel by Manly Wade Wellman Then you won't let Count Dracula rest in his tomb, inquired Lee Cobbett, his square face creasing with a grin. Five of them sat in the parlor of Judge Keith Hillary Percivant's hotel suite on Central Park West. The judge lounged in an armchair, a wine glass in his big old hand. On this, his 87th birthday, his blue eyes were clear, penetrating, his once tawny hair and mustache had gone blizzard white, but both grew thick and his square face showed rosy. In his tailored blue leisure suit, he still looked powerfully deep-chested and broad-shouldered. Blocky Lee Cobbett wore jacket and slacks almost as brown as his face. Next to him sat Laurel Parcher, small and young and cinnamon-haired. The others were Natty, Phil Drum, the summer theater producer, and Isabel Arrington from a wire press service. She was blonde, expensively dressed. She smoked a dark cigarette with a white tip. Her pen scribbled swiftly. Dracula's as much alive as Sherlock Holmes, argued Drum. All the revivals of all the plays, all the films. Your musical should wake the dead anyway, said Cobbett, drinking. What's your main number, Phil? Garlic time? Gory, gory, hallelujah. Let's have Christian charity here, Lee. Purvisant came down to Drum's rescue anyway. Miss Arrington came to interview me. 
pour her some wine and let me try to answer her questions. I'm interested in Mr. Cobbett's remarks, said Isabel Arrington, her voice deliberately throaty. He's an authority on the supernatural. Well, perhaps, admitted Cobbett, and Miss Parcher has had some experiences, but Judge Percivant is the true authority, the author of Vampiricon. I've read it in paperback, said Isabel Arrington. Phil, it mentions a vampire belief up in Connecticut, where you're having your show. What's that town again? The slow, he told her. We're making a wonderful old stone barn into a theater. I've invited Lee and Miss Parcher to visit. She looked at Drum. Is the slow a resort town? Not yet, but maybe the show will bring tourists. In Deslo, up to now, peace and quiet is the chief business. If you drop your shoe, everybody in town will think somebody's blowing the safe. Deslo's not far from Jewett City, observed Percivant. There were vampires there about a century and a quarter ago. A family named Ray was afflicted, and to the east in Rhode Island, there was a lively vampire folklore in recent years. Let's leave Rhode Island to H.P. Lovecraft, imitator suggested Cobbett. What do you call your show, Phil? The Land Beyond the Forest, said Grum. We're casting it now, using locals in bit parts. But we have gone to Chastel to play Dracula's Countess. I never knew that Dracula had a countess, said Laurel Parcher. There was a stage star named Chastel long ago when I was young, said Percivant. Just the one name, Chastel. Gonda's her daughter, and a year or so ago Gonda came to live in Deslo, Drum told them. Her mother's buried there. Gonda has invested in our production. Is that why she has a part in it? asked Isabel Arrington. She has a part in it because she's beautiful and gifted, replied Drum rather stuffily. Old people say she's the very picture of her mother. Speaking of pictures, here are some to prove it. He offered two glossy prints to Isabel Arrington, who murmured, Very sweet, and passed them to Laurel Parcher. Cobbett leaned to see. One picture seemed copied from an older one. It showed a woman who stood with unconscious stateliness in a gracefully draped robe with a tiara binding her rich flow of dark hair. The other picture was of a woman in fashionable evening dress, her hair ordered in modern fashion, with a face strikingly like that of the woman in the other photograph. Oh, she's lovely, said Laurel. Isn't she, Lee? Isn't she, echoed Drum. Magnificent, said Cobbett, handing the pictures to Purvisant, who studied them gravely. Chastel was in Richmond just after the First World War, he said slowly. A dazzling lady, Macbeth. I was in love with her. Everyone was. Did you tell her you loved her? asked Laurel. Yes, we had supper together twice. Then she went ahead with her tour, and I sailed to England and studied at Oxford. I never saw her again, but she's more or less why I never married. Silence a moment. Then, the land beyond the forest, Laurel repeated. Isn't there a book called that? There is indeed, my child, said the judge. By Emily Deslaska, Gerard, about Transylvania, where Dracula came from. That's why we used the title, that's what Transylvania means, put in Drum. It's all right. The book's out of copyright. But I'm surprised to find someone who's heard of it. I'll protect your guilty secret, Phil, promised Isabel Arrington. What's over there in your window, Judge? Percivant turned to look. Whatever it is, he said, it's not Peter Pan. Cobbett sprang up and ran towards the half-draped window. A silhouette with head and shoulders hung in the June night. He had a glimpse of a face, rich mouth with bright eyes. Then it was gone. Laurel had hurried up behind him. He hoisted the window sash and leaned out. Nothing. The street was fourteen stories down. The lights of moving cars crawled distantly. The wall below was course after course of dull brick with recesses of other windows to right and left, below, above. Cobbett studied the wall, his hands braced on the sill. Be carefully, Laurel's voice besought him. He came back to face the other. Nobody's out there, he said evenly. Nobody could have been. It's just a wall, nothing to hang to. Even that sill would be tricky to stand on. But I saw something, and so did Judge Percivant, said Isabel Arrington, the cigarette trembling on her fingers. So did I, said Cobbett. Didn't you, Laurel? Only a face. Isabel Arrington was calm again. If it's a trick, Phil, you played a good one, but don't expect me to put it in my story. Drum shook his head nervously. I didn't play any trick, I swear. Don't try this on old friends, she jabbed at him. 
First those pictures, then whatever was up against the glass. I'll use the pictures, but I won't write that a weird vision presided over this birthday party. How about a drink all around, suggested Percivant. He poured for them. Isabel Arrington wrote down her answers to more questions, then said she must go. Drum rose to escort her. You'll be at Deslow tomorrow, Lee? he asked. And Laurel, too. You said we could find quarters there. The maple tree's a good motel, said Drum. I've already reserved cabins for the two of you. On the spur of the moment, said Percival suddenly, I think I'll come along, if there's space for me. I'll check it out for you, Judge, said Drum. He departed with Isabel Arrington. Cobb spoke to Purvisant. Isn't that rather offhand, he asked, deciding to come with us? I was thinking about Chastel, Percivant smiled gently, about making a pilgrimage to a grave. We'll drive up about nine tomorrow morning. I'll be ready, Lee. Cobbett and Laurel, too, went out. They walked down a flight of stairs to the floor below, where both their rooms were located. Do you think Phil Drum rigged up that illusion for us, asked Cobbett. If he did, he used the face of that actress, Chastel. He glanced keenly at her. You saw that? I thought I did, and so did you. They kissed goodnight at the door to her room. Percivant was ready next morning when Cobbett knocked. He had only one suitcase and a thick, brown blotched malacca cane banded with silver below its curved handle. I'm taking only a few necessaries. I'll buy socks and such things in Deslow, and we stay more than a couple of days, he said. No, don't carry it for me. I'm quite capable. When they reached the hotel garage, Laurel was putting her luggage in the trunk of Cobbett's black sedan. Judge Percivant declined the front seat beside Cobbett, held the door for Laurel to get in and sat in the rear. They rolled out into bright June sunlight. Cobbett drove them east on Interstate 95, mile after mile along the Connecticut shore, past service stations, markets, sandwich shops. Now and then they glimpsed Long Island Sound to the right. At toll gates, Cobbett threw quarters into hoppers and drove on. New Rochelle to Port Chester, Laurel half chanted, Norwalk, Bridgeport, Stratford. Where in 1851, devils plagued the minister's home, put in Purvisant. That makes a poem, said Laurel. You can get that effect by reading any timetable, said Cobbett. We miss a couple of good names, Mystic and Giant's Neck, though they aren't far off from our route, and Griswold. That means Grey Woods, where the judge's book says Horace Ray was born. There's no Griswold on the Connecticut map anymore, said the judge. Vanished, said Laurel. Maybe it appears at just a certain time of the day, along about sundown. She laughed, but the judge was grave. Here, we'll pass by New Haven, he said. I was at Yale here 70 years ago. They rolled across the Connecticut River between Old Saybrook and Old Lyme outside New London. Cobbett turned them north on State Highway 82 and near Jewett City to Catulane Road, that brought them into Deslow, not long after noon. There were pleasant clapboard cottages among elm trees and flower beds. Main Street had bright shops with farther along the belfry of a sturdy old church. Cobbett drove them to a sign saying Maple Tree Court. A row of cabins faced a cement floored colonnade. The fronts painted white with blue doors and window frames. In the office, Phil Drum stood at the desk talking to the plump proprietors. Welcome home, he greeted them. Judge, I was asking Mrs. Simpson here to reserve you a cabin. At the far end of the road, sir, the lady said, I'd have put you next to your two friends, but so many theater folks have already moved in. Long ago I learned to be happy with any shelter, the judge assured her. They saw Laurel to her cabin and put her suitcases inside, then walked to the farthest cabin where Purvisant would stay. Finally, Drum followed Cobbett to the space next to Laurel's. Inside, Cobbett produced a fifth of bourbon from his briefcase. Drum trotted away to fetch ice. Purvisant came to join them. It's good of you to look after us, Cobbett said to Drum above his glass. Oh, I'll get my own back, Drum assured him. The judge and you, distinguished folklore experts, I'll have you in all the papers. Whatever you like, said Cobbett. Let's have lunch as soon as Laurel is freshened up. They ate four crab cakes and flounder at a little restaurant while Drum talked about the land beyond the forest. He had signed the minor film star Caspar Merrick to play Dracula. He has a fine baritone singing voice at Drum. He'll be at afternoon rehearsal. And gone to Chastel, inquired Purvisant, buttering a roll. 
She'll be there tonight, Drum sounded happy about that. This afternoon's mostly for bits and chorus numbers. I'm directing as well as producing. They finished their lunch and Drum rose. If you're not tired, come see our theater. It was only a short walk through town to the converted barn. Cobbett judged they had been built in colonial times with a recent roof of composition tile, but with walls of shrubbery, brown-gray New England stone. Across a narrow side street stood the old white church with a hedge-bordered cemetery. Quite that old burying ground, commented Drum. Nobody spaded under there now. There's a modern cemetery on the far side, but Chastel's tomb is there. Quite a picturesque one. I'd like to see it, said Pervasant, leaning on his silver-banded cane. The barn's interior was set with rows of folding chairs, enough for several hundred spectators. On a stage at the far end, workmen moved here and there under lights. Drum led his guest up steps at the side. High in the loft, catwalk zigzagged, and a dark curtain hung like a broad guillotine blade. Drum pointed out canvas flats painted to resemble grim castle walls. Pervisant nodded and questioned. I'm no authority on what you might find in Transylvania, he said, but this looks convincing. A man walking from the wings toward them. Hello, Casper, Drum greeted them. I want you to meet Judge Pervisant and Lee Cobbett, and Miss Laurel Parcher, of course. He gestured the introductions. This is Mr. Casper Merrick, or Count Dracula. Merrick was elegantly tall, handsome, with carefully groomed black hair. Sweepingly, he bowed above Laurel's hand and smiled at them all. Judge Pervisant's writing, I know, of course, he said richly. I read what I can about vampires, and as much as I'm to be one. Places for the delusion number, called the stage manager. Cobbett, Pervisant, and Laurel went down the steps and sat on chairs. Eight men and eight girls hurried into view dressed in knockabout summer clothes. Someone struck chords on a piano, drum gestured importantly, and the chorus sang. Merrick, coming downstage, took solo on a verse. All joined in the refrain. Then Drum made them sing it over again. After that, two comedians made much of confusing the words vampire and empire. Cobbett found it tedious. He excused himself to his companions and strolled out and across to the old tree-crowded churchyard. The gravestones bore interesting epitaphs. Not only the familiar pause, O stranger passing by, as you are now, so once was I, and but on earth to bloom in heaven, but several of more originality. One bewailed the man who, since he had been lost at sea, could hardly have been there at all. Another bore beneath a bat-winged face a declaration, Death pays all debts, and the date 1907, which Cobbett associated with a financial panic. Toward the center of the graveyard, under a drooping willow, stood a shed-like structure of heavy granite blocks. Cobbett picked his way to the door of heavy grillwork, which was fastened with a rusty padlock the size of a sardine can. On the lintel were strongly carved letters, Chastel. Here then was a tomb of the stage beauty Pervisant remembered so romantically. Cobbett peered through the bars. It was murkily dusty in there. The floor was coarsely flagged, and among sooty shadows at the rear stood a sort of stone chest that must contain the body. Cobbett turned and went back to the theater. Inside, piano music rang wildly, and the people of the chorus desperately rehearsed what must be meant for a folk dance. Oh, it's exciting, said Laurel as Cobbett sat down beside her. Where have you been? Visiting the tomb of Chastel. Chastel? echoed Pervisant. I must see that tomb. Songs and dance ensembles went on. In the midst of them, a brisk reporter from Hartford appeared to interview Pervisant and Cobbett. At last, drums resoundingly dismissed the players on stage and joined his guests. Principals rehearse at 8 o'clock, he announced. Gonda Chastel will be here. She'll want to meet you. Could I count on you then? Count on me at least, said Pervisant. Just now I feel like resting before dinner. And so, I think, does Laurel here? Yes, I'd like to lie down for a little, said Laurel. Why don't we all meet for dinner at the place where we had lunch, said Cobbett. You can come too, Phil. Thanks. I have a date with some backers from New London. It was half past five when they went out. Cobbett went to his quarters, stretched out on the bed, and gave himself the thought. He hadn't come to Deslo because of this musical interpretation of the Dracula legend. Laurel had come because he was coming, and Pervisant, on a sudden impulse, 
That might have been more than a wish to visit the grave of Chastel. But Cobbett was here because this, he knew, had been vampire country. Maybe still was vampire country. He remembered the story in Purvisant's book about vampires at Jewett City, as reported in the Norwich Courier in 1854. Horace Ray, from the now-vanished town of Griswold, had died of a wasting disease. Thereafter, his oldest son, then his second son, had also gone to their graves. When a third son sickened, friends and relatives dug up Horace Ray and the two dead brothers and burned the bodies in a roaring fire. The surviving son got well, and something like that had happened in Exeter, near Providence in Rhode Island. Very well, why organize and present a Dracula musical here in Deslo, so near those places? Cobbett had met Phil Drum in the South the year before, knew him for a brilliant if erratic producer, who relished tales of devils and the dead who walk by night. Drum might have known enough stage magic to have raked that seeming appearance at Purvisant's window in New York. That is, if indeed, it was only a seeming appearance, not a real face. Might it have been real? A manifestation of the unreal? Cobbett had seen enough of what people dismissed as unreal and possible to wonder. A soft knock came at the door. It was Laurel. She wore green slacks, a green jacket, and she smiled, as always, at sight of Cobbett's face. They saw Purvisant's cabin. A note on the door said, meet me at the cafe. When they entered there, Purvisant hailed them from the kitchen door. Dinner's ready, he hailed them. I've been supervising in person, and I paid well for the privilege. A waiter brought a laden tray. He arranged platters of red-drenched spaghetti and bowls of salad on a table. Purvisant himself sprinkled Parmesan cheese. No salt or pepper, he warned. I seasoned it myself, and you can take my word, it's exactly right. Cobbett poured red wine into glasses. Laurel took a forkful of spaghetti. Delicious, she cried. What's in it, Judge? Not only ground beef and tomatoes and onions and garlic, replied Purvisant. I added majoram and green pepper and chili and thyme and bay leaf and oregano and parsley and a couple of other important ingredients and I also minced in some Italian sausage. Cobbett, too, ate with enthusiastic appetite. I won't order any dessert, he declared. I want to keep the taste of this in my mouth. There's more in the kitchen for dessert if you want it, the judge assured him. But here, I have a couple of keepsakes for you. He handed each of them a small silvery object. Cobbett examined his. It was smoothly wrapped in foil. He wondered if it was a nut meat. You have pockets, I perceive, the judge said. Put those into them, and don't open them, or my wish for you won't come true. When they had finished eating, a full moon had begun to rise in the darkening sky. They headed for the theater. A number of visitors sat in the chairs, and the stage lights looked bright. Drums stood beside the piano, talking to two plump men in summer business suits. As Purvisant and the others came down the aisle, Drum eagerly beckoned them and introduced them to his companions, the financial backers with whom he had taken dinner. We're very interested, said one. This vampire legend intrigues anyone, if you forget that a vampire's motivation is simply nourishment. No, something more than that, offered Purvisant. A social motivation. Social motivation, repeated the other backer. A vampire wants company of its own kind. A victim infected becomes a vampire too, and an associate. Otherwise, the original vampire would be a disconsolate loner. There's a lot in what you say, said Drum, impressed. After that, there was financial talk, something in which Cobbett could not intelligently join. Then someone else approached, and both the backers stared. It was a tall, supremely graceful woman with red, lighted, black hair in a bun at her nape, a woman of impressive figure and assurance. She wore a sweeping blue dress fitted to her slim waist with a frill-edged neckline. Her arms were bare and white and sweetly turned with jeweled bracelets on them. Drum almost ran to bring her close to the group. Gonda Chastel, he said, half prayerfully. Gonda, you'll want to meet these people. The two backers stuttered, admiring at her. Purvisant bowed. Laura smiled. Gonda Chastel gave Cobbett her slim, cool hand. You know so much about this thing we're trying to do here, she said in a voice like cream. Drum watched them. His face looked plaintive. Judge Purvisant has taught me a lot, Miss Chastel, said Cobbett. 
He'll tell you that once he knew your mother. I remember her. Not very clearly, said Ganda Shastel. She died when I was just a little thing, thirty years ago. And I followed her here. Now I make my home here. You look very much like her, said Purvisan. I'm proud to be like my mother in any way, she smiled at them. She could be overwhelming, Cobbett told himself. And Miss Parcher, went on Ganda Shastel, turning toward Laurel. What a little presence she is. She should be in our show. I don't know what part, but she should. She smiled dazzlingly. Now then, Phil wants me on stage. Knock at the door number, Gonda, said Drum. Gracefully, she mounted the steps. The piano sounded and she sang. She was the best song, felt Cobbett, that he had heard so far in the rehearsals. Are they seeking for a shelter from the night? Gonda Chastel sang richly. Caspar Merrick entered to join in a recitative. Then the chorus streamed on, singing somewhat shrilly. Pervisant and Laurel had sat down. Cobbett strode back up the aisle and out under a moon that rained silver blue like. He found his way to the churchyard. The tree that had offered pleasant afternoon shade now made a dubious darkness. He walked underneath branches that seemed to lower like hovering wings as he approached the tomb structures at the center. The barred door had been massively locked, now stood open. He peered into the gloom within. After a moment, he stepped across the threshold upon the flagged floor. He had to grope with one hand upon the rough wall. At last, he almost stumbled upon the great stone chest at the rear. It, too, was flung open. Its lid heaved back against the wall. There was, of course, complete darkness within it. He flicked on a cigar lighter. The flame showed him the inside of the stone coffer, solidly made and about ten feet long. Its sides of gray marble were snugly fitted. Inside lay a coffin of rich dark wood with silver fittings, and here, yet again, was an open lid. Bending close to the smudged silk lining, Cobbett seemed to catch an odor of stuffy sharpness, like dried herbs. He snapped off his light and frowned in the dark. Then he groped back to the door, emerged into the open, and headed for the theater again. Mr. Cobbett, said the beautiful voice of Gonda Chastel. She stood at the graveyard's edge, beside a sagging willow. She was almost as tall as he. Her eyes glowed in the moonlight. You came to find the truth about my mother, she half accused. I was bound to try, he replied. Ever since I saw a certain face at a certain window of a certain New York hotel, she stepped back from him. You know she's a, a vampire, Cobbett finished for her. Yes. I beg you to be helpful, merciful. But here was no supplication in her voice. I already realized long ago. That's why I live in Little Deslow. I want to find a way to give her rest. Night after night, I wonder how. I understand that, said Cobbett. Gonda Chastel breathed deeply. You know all about these things. I think there's something about you that could daunt a vampire. If so, I don't know what it is, said Cobbett truthfully. Make me a solemn promise that you won't return to her tomb, that you won't tell others what you and I know about her. I, I want to think how we two together can do something for her. If you wish, I'll say nothing, he promised. Her hand clutched his. The cast took a five-minute break. It must be time to go to work again, she said, suddenly bright. Let's go back and help the thing along. They went. Inside, the performers were gathering on stage. Drum stared unhappily as Gonda Chastel and Cobbett came down the aisle. Cobbett sat with Laurel and Percivant and listened to the rehearsal. Adaptation from Bram Stoker's novel was free, to say the least. Dracula's eerie plottings were much hampered by his having a countess a walking dead beauty he strove to become a spirit of good. There were some songs and interesting minor keys. There was a dance in which men and women leaped like kangaroos. Finally, Drum called a halt, and the performers trooped wearily to the wings. Gonda Chastel lingered, talking to Laurel. I wonder, my dear, if you haven't had acting experience, she said. Only in school entertainments down south, when I was little. Phil, said Gonda Chastel, Miss Parcher is a good type, has good presence. There ought to be something for her in the show. You're very kind, but I'm afraid that's impossible, said Laura, smiling. You may change your mind, Miss Parcher. Will you and your friends come to my house for a nightcap? 
Thank you, said Pervisant. We have some notes to make, and we must make them together. Until tomorrow evening, then, Mr. Cobbett will remember our agreement. She went away toward the back of the stage. Percivant and Laurel walked out. Drum hurried up the aisle and caught Cobbett's elbow. I saw you, he said harshly. Saw you both as you came in. And we saw you, Phil. What's this about? She likes you. It was half an accusation. Fawns on you almost. Cobbett grinned and twitched his arm free. What's the matter, Phil? Are you in love with her? Yes, goddammit, I am. I'm in love with her. She knows it, but she won't let me come to her house. And you, the first time she meets you, she invites you. Easy does it, Phil, said Cobbett. If it'll do you any good, I'm in love with someone else. And that takes just about all my spare time. He hurried out to overtake his companions. Percivant swung his cane, almost jauntingly as they returned through the moonlight to the auto court. What notes are you talking about, Judge? asked Cobbett. I'll tell you at my quarters. What do you think of the show? Perhaps I'll like it better after they've rehearsed more, said Laurel. I don't follow it at present. Here and there it strikes me as limp, added Cobbett. They sat down in the judge's cabin. He poured them drinks. Now, he said, there are certain things to recognize here, things I more or less expected to find. A mystery judge? asked Laurel. Not so much that, if I expected to find them. How far are we from Jewett City? Twelve or fifteen miles as a crow flies, estimated Cobbett. And Jewett City is where that vampire family, the Rays, lived and died. Died twice, you might say, nodded Pervisant, stroking his white mustache. Back about a century and a quarter ago. And here's what might be a matter of Ray family history. I've been thinking about Chastel, whom once I greatly admired about her full name. But she had only one name, didn't she? asked Laurel. On the stage, she used one name, yes. So did Bernhardt, so did Deuce, so later did Garbo. But all of them had full names. Now, before I went to dinner, I made two telephone calls to theatrical historians I know to learn Chastel's full name. And she had a full name, prompted Cobbett. Indeed, she did. Her full name was Chastel Ray. Cobbett and Laurel looked at him in deep silence. Not apt to be just coincidence, elaborated Pervisant. Now then, I gave you some keepsakes today. Here's mine, said Cobbett, pulling the foil wrap bit from his shirt pocket. And I have mine here, said Laurel, her hand at her throat, in a little locket I have on this chain. Keep it there, Pervisant urged her. Wear it around your neck at all times. Lee, have yours always on your person. Those are garlic cloves, and you know what they're good for. You can only guess why I cut up a lot of garlic in our spaghetti for dinner. You think there's a vampire here? Offered Laurel. A specific vampire. The judge took a deep breath into his broad chest. Chastel. Chastel Ray. I believe it too, declared Cobbett tonelessly. And Laurel nodded. Cobbett looked at the watch on his wrist. It's past one in the morning, he said. Perhaps we'll all be better off if we had some sleep. They said their good nights, and Laurel and Cobbett walked to where their two doors stood side by side. Laurel put her key in the lock, but did not turn it at once. She peered across the moonlit street. Who's that over there, she whispered. Maybe I ought to say, what's that? Cobbett looked. Nothing. You're just nervous. Good night, dear. She went in and shut the door. Cobbett quickly crossed the street. Mr. Cobbett, said the voice of Gon de Chastel. I wonder what you wanted so late at night, he said, walking close to her. She had undone her dark hair and let it flow to her shoulders. She was, Cobbett thought, as beautiful a woman as he had ever seen. I wanted to be sure about you, she said, that you respect your promise to me not to go into the churchyard. I keep my promises, Miss Chastel. He felt a deep, hushed silence all around them. Not even the leaves rustled in the trees. I had hoped you wouldn't venture even this far, she went on. You and your friends are new in town. You might tempt her specifically. Her eyes burned at him. You know I don't mean that as a compliment. She turned to walk away. He fell into step beside her. But you're not afraid of her, he said. Of my own mother? She was a ray, said Cobbett. Each ray sapped the blood of his kinsmen. 
Judge Percivant told me all about it. Again, the gaze of her dark, brilliant eyes. Nothing like that has ever happened between my mother and me. She stopped, and so did he. Her slim, strong hand hooked him by the wrist. You're wise and brave, she said. I think you may have come here for a good purpose, not just about the show. I tried to have good purposes. The light of the moon soaked through the overhead branches as they walked on. Will you come to my house, she invited. I'll walk to the churchyard, replied Cobbett. I said I wouldn't go into it, but I can stand at the edge. Don't go in. I've promised that I wouldn't miss Chastel. She walked back the way they had come. He followed the street under silent elms until he reached the border of the churchyard. One light flecked and spattered the tombstones. Deep shadows lay like pools. He had a sense of being watched from within. As he gazed, he saw movement among the graves. He could not define it, but it was there. He glimpsed or fancied he glimpsed a head, indistinct in outline, as though swathed in dark fabric. Then another, another. They huddled in a group, as though to gaze at him. I wish you'd go back to your quarters, said Gon de Chastel beside him. She had drifted after him, silent as a shadow herself. Miss Chastel, he said, tell me something if you can. Whatever happened to the town or village of Griswold? Griswold, she echoed. What's Griswold? That means Grey Woods. Your ancestor or your relative Horace Ray came from Griswold to die in Jewett City, and I've told you that I knew your mother was born a Ray. Her shining eyes seemed to flood upon him. I didn't know that, she said. He gazed into the churchyard at those hints of furtive movement. The hands of the dead reach out for the living, murmured Gonda Chastel. Reach out for me, he asked. Perhaps for both of us. Just now, we may be the only living souls awakened, Deslow. She gazed at him again. But you're able to defend yourself somehow. What makes you think that? He inquired, aware of the clove of garlic in his shirt pocket. Because they, in the churchyard there, they watch. But they hold away from you. You don't invite them. Nor do you, apparently, said Cobbett. I hope you're not trying to make fun of me, she said, her voice barely audible. On my soul, I'm not. On your soul, she repeated. Good night, Mr. Cobbett. Again, she moved away, tall and proud and graceful. He watched her out of sight. Then he headed back toward the motor court. Nothing moved in the empty street. Only one or two lights shone here and there in closed shops. He thought he heard a soft rustle behind him, but did not look back. As he reached his own door, he heard Laurel scream behind horrors. Judge Purvisant sat in his cubicle, his jacket off, studying a worn little brown book. Skinner said letters on the spine and myths and legends of our own land. He had read the passage so often that he could almost repeat it from memory. To lay this monster, he must be taken up and burned. At least his heart must be. And he must be disinterred in the daytime when he is asleep and unaware. There were other ways, reflected Purvisant. It must be very late by now. Rather, it must be early. But he had no intention of going to sleep. Not when stirs of motion sounded outside along the concrete walkway in front of his cabin. Did motion stand still just beyond the door there? Purvisant's great veined hand touched the front of his shirt, beneath which a bag of garlic hung like an amulet. Garlic. Was that enough? He himself was fond of garlic, judiciously employed in sauces and salads. But then he could see himself in the mirror of the bureau yonder, could see his broad old face with its white sweep of mustache like a wreath of snow on a sill. It was a clear image of a face, not a calm face just then, but a determined one. Purvisant smiled at it, the glimpse of even teeth that were still his own. He flicked up his shirt cuff and looked at his watch. Half past one, about more or less. In June, even with daylight saving time, dawn would come early. Dawn sent vampires back to the tombs that were their melancholy refuge, asleep and unaware, as Skinner had specified. Putting the book aside, he poured himself a small drink of bourbon, dropped in cubes of ice and a trickle of water and sipped. He had drunk several times during that day, when on most days he partook of only a single highball by advice of his doctor. But just now he was grateful for the pungent, walnutty taste of the liquor. It was one of Earth's natural things, a good companion when not abused. 
From a table, he took a folder of scribbled notes. He looked at jottings from the works of Montague Summers. These offered the proposition that a plague of vampires usually stemmed from a single source of infection, a king or queen vampire, whose feast of blood drove victims to their graves to rise in their turn. If the original vampires were found and destroyed, the others relaxed to rest as normally dead bodies. Bram Stoker had followed the same gospel when he wrote Dracula, and doubtless Bram Stoker had known. Pervasant looked at another page, this time a poem copied from James Grant's Curious Mysteries of All Nations. It was a ballad in archaic language that dealt with baleful happenings in the town of Pest. Budapest? It was the corpses that a churchyard's filled, that did at midnight lumber up our stairs. They suck our blood, the gory banquet swilled, and harried every soul with hideous fears. Several verses down. They barred with bolts of iron the churchyard pale to keep them out, but all this would not do, for when a dead man has learned to draw nail, he can also burst an iron bolt in two. Many times Purvisant had tried to trace the author of that verse. He wondered if it was not something quaintly confected not long before 1880 when Grant published his work. At any rate, the judge felt that he knew what it meant, the experience that it remembered. He put aside the notes too and picked up his spotted walking stick. Clamping the balance of it firmly in his left hand, he twisted the handle with his right and pulled. Out of the hollow shank slid a pale, bright blade, keen and lean and edged on both front and back. Purvisant permitted himself a smile above it. This was one of his most cherished possessions. This silver weapon said to have been forged a thousand years ago by St. Dunstan. Bending, he spelled out the runic writing upon it. Sic perant omnis imici tui domini. That was the end of the fiercely triumphant song of Deborah in the book of Judges. So perish all thine enemies, O Lord. Whether the work of St. Dunstan or not, the medal was silver. The writing was a warrior's prayer. Silver and writing had proved their strength against evil in the past. Then outside, a loud tremulous cry of mortal terror. Purvisant sprang out of his chair on the instant. Blade in hand, he fairly ripped his door open and ran out. He saw Cobbett in front of Laurel's door, wrenching at the knob and hurried there like a man half his age. Open up, Laurel, he heard Cobbett call. It's Lee out here. The door gave in where his purvis not reached it, and he and Cobbett pressed into the lighted room. Laurel half crouched in the middle of the floor. Her trembling hand pointed to a rear window. She tried to come in, Laurel stammered. There's nothing at that window, said Cobbett, but even as he spoke, there was. A face, pale as tallow, crowded against the glass. They saw wide, staring eyes, a mouth that opened and squirmed, teeth twinkled sharply. Cobbett started forward, but Purvisant caught him by the shoulder. Let me, he said. Advancing toward the window, the point of his blade lifted. The face at the window writhed convulsively as a silver weapon came against the pane with a clink. The mouth opened as though to shout, but no sound came. The face fell back and vanished from their sight. I've seen that face before, said Cobbett hoarsely. Yes, said Purvisant. My hotel window, and since. He dropped the point of the blade to the floor. Outside came a whirring rush of sound, like feet, many of them. We ought to wake up the people at the office, said Cobbett. I doubt if anyone in this little town could be awakened, Purvisant told him evenly. I have it in mind that every living soul, except the three of us, is sound asleep, entranced. But out there, Laurel gestured at the door, where something seemed to be repressing. I said, every living soul. Purvisant looked from her to Cobbett. Living, he repeated. He paced across the floor and with his point scratched a perpendicular line upon it. Across this he carefully drove a horizontal line, making a cross. The pushing abruptly ceased. There it is, at the window again, breathed Laurel. Purvisant took long steps to where the face hovered, with black hair streaming about it. He scraped the glass with silver blade up and down, then across, making lines upon it. The face drew away. He moved to mark similar crosses on the other windows. You see, he said, quietly triumphant, the force of old, old charms. He sat down on a chair heavily. His face was weary, but he looked at Laurel and smiled. 
It might help if we manage to pity those poor things up there, he said. Pity? She almost cried out. Yes, he said, and quoted. Think how sad it must be to thirst always for a scorned elixir, the salt of Quodian blood. I know that, volunteered Cobbett. It's from a poem by Richard Wilbur, a damned unhappy poet. Quodition, repeated Laurel to herself. That means something that keeps coming back, that returns daily, Cobbett said. It's a term used to refer to recurrent fever, added Purvisant. Laura and Cobbett sat down together on the bed. I would say that for the time being we're safe here, declared Purvisant. Not at ease, but at least safe. At dawn, danger will go to sleep and we can open the door. But why are we safe and nobody else, Laura cried out. Why are we awake? with everyone else in this town asleep and helpless, apparently because we, all of us, wear garlic, replied Percivant patiently, and because we ate garlic, plenty of it, at dinner time, and because there are crosses, crude but unmistakable, wherever something might try to come in. I won't ask you to be calm, but I'll ask you to be resolute. I'm resolute, said Cobbett between clenched teeth. I'm ready to go out there and face them. If you did that, even with the garlic, said Percivant, you'd last about as long as a pint of whiskey in a five-handed poker game. No, Lee, relax as much as you can, and let's talk. They talked, while outside strange presences could be felt rather than heard. Their talk was of anything and everything but where they were and why. Cobbett remembered strange things he had encountered in towns, along mountains, along desolate roads, and what he had been able to do about them. Percivant told of a vampire he had known and defeated in upstate New York, of a werewolf in his own southern countryside. Laurel, at Cobbett's urging, sang songs, old songs from her own rustic home place. Her voice was sweet. When she sang, round as the ring, faces came and hung like smudges outside the cross scored windows. She saw and sang again an old Appalachian carol called Mary. She heard a knock in the night. The faces drifted away again and the hours, too, drifted away one by one. There's a horde of vampires on the night street here, then, Cobbett said at last, brought up the subject of their problem. And they lull the people of Deslo to sleep, to be helpless victims, agreed Purvisant. About this show, the land beyond the forest, mightn't it be welcomed as a chance to spread the infection? Even a town full of sleepers couldn't feed a growing community of blood drinkers. If we could deal with the source, the original infection began Cobbett. The mistress of them, the queen, said Percivant. Yes, the one who walking by night rouses them all. If she could be destroyed, they'd all die properly. He glanced at the front window. The moonlight had a touch of slaty gray. Almost morning, pronounced, time for a visit to her tomb. I gave my promise I wouldn't go there, said Cobbett. But I didn't promise, said Percivant, rising. You stay here with Laurel his silver blade in hand, he stepped out into the darkness from which the moon had all but dropped away. Overhead stars were fading out, dawn was at hand. He sensed the flutter of movement on the far side of the street, an almost inaudible gibbering of sound. Steadily he walked across. He saw nothing along the sidewalk there, heard nothing. Resolutely he tramped to the churchyard, his weapon poised. More grayness had come to dilute the dark. He pushed his way through the hedge of shrubs, stepped in upon the grass and paused at the side of a grave. Above it hung an eddy of soft mist, no larger than the swirl of water draining from a sink. As Percivant watched, it seemed to soak into the earth and disappear. That, he said to himself, is what a soul looks like when it seeks to regain its coffin. On he walked, step by weary, purposeful step toward the central crypt. A ray of the early sun stealing between heavily leafed boughs made his way more visible. In this dawn, he would find what he would find. He knew that. The crypt's door of open bars was held shut by its heavy padlock. He examined that lock more closely. After a moment, he slid the point of his blade into the rusted keyhole and judiciously pressed his way, then that, and back again the first way. The spring quickly relaxed, and he dragged the door open. Holding his breath, he entered. The lid of the great stone vault was closed down. He took hold of the edge and heaved. The lid was heavy, but rose with a complaining grate of the hinges. Inside he saw a dark closed coffin. He lifted the lid of that, too. She lay there, calm face, the eyes half shut, as though dozing. 
Chastel Sid Percivanter, not Ganda, Chastel. The eyelids fluttered, that was all, but he knew that she heard what he said. Now you can rest, he said. Rest in peace, really in peace. He set the point of his silver blade at the swell of her left breast. Leaning both his broad hands upon the curved handle, he drove it downwards with all his strength. She made a faint squeak of sound. Blood sprang up as he cleared his weapon. More light shone in. He could see a dark moisture fading from the blade like evaporating dew. In the coffin, Chastel's proud shape shriveled, darkened. Quickly, he slammed the coffin shut, then lowered the lid of the vault into place and went quickly out. He pushed the door shut again and fastened the stubborn old lock. As he walked back through the churchyard, among the graves, a bird twittered over his head. More distantly, he heard the hum of a car's motor. The town was waking up. In a growing radiance, he walked back across the street. By now, his steps were the steps of an old man, old and very tired. Inside Laurel's cabin, Laurel and Cobbett were stirring instant coffee into hot water and plastic cups. They questioned the judge with their tired eyes. She's finished, he said shortly. What will you tell Gonda? asked Cobbett. Chasta was Gonda. But she was Gonda, said Percivant, again sitting down. Chastel died. The infection weakened her out of her tomb, and she told people she was Gonda, and naturally they believed her, he sagged wearily. Now that she's finished and at rest, those others, the ones she had bled, who also rose at night, will rest too. Laurel took a sip of coffee. Above the cup, her face was pale. Why do you say Shasta was Gonda? She asked the judge. How can you know that? I wonder from the very beginning. I was utterly sure just now. Sure, said Laurel. How can you be sure? Percivant smiled at her the faintest of smiles. My dear, don't you think a man always recognizes a woman he has loved? He seemed to recover his characteristic defiant vigor. He rose and went to the door and put his hand on the knob. Now, if you'll just excuse me for a while. Don't you think we'd better hurry and leave, Cobbett asked him, before people miss her and ask questions? Not at all, said Percivant, his voice strong again. If we're gone, they'll ask questions about us too, possibly embarrassing questions. No, we'll stay. We'll eat a good breakfast, or at least pretend to eat it. And we'll be as surprised as the rest of them about the disappearance of their leading lady. I'll do my best, vowed Laurel. I know you will, my child, said Percivant, and went out the door.